We turn our attention back to our text from Exodus 4, simply reread verse 1. The context of uh, Exodus 4 is that God has appeared to Moses in the burning bush and called him to be the deliverer, the instrument that God will use to free his people from their bondage and slavery in Egypt. And as we see so many times in Scripture, Moses is a reluctant choice. He comes up with one reason, one excuse after another why he's not the right guy for this job. And here in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. This is the word of the Lord. For many years when I was the senior pastor at St. Paul, we ran a ministry that was called Celebrate Recovery. Anybody familiar with Celebrate Recovery? It's a 12-step program. And what differentiates it from uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or Al-Anon or any of these other programs is that in those programs, you are encouraged to appeal to a higher power and to seek the strength and the power from that higher power to change and amend your life. Well, in Celebrate Recovery, we don't address a higher power because we know it's Jesus Christ. And so Celebrate Recovery is a Christ-centered 12-step program. If you were to Google online, you'd see that it's addressed to people, and I quote, struggling with pain or addiction of any kind. Its purpose and intent is to create a safe place where you can find community and freedom from the issues that are controlling our lives. Now, I, I bring that up to relate one of the most powerful moments I have had in ministry in 40 years. I used to go to celebrate recovery to be supportive as the senior pastor, and let's be honest, hey, I've got some struggles in my life, right? Everybody does. I, I've got some pain. I've known some pain in my life. So it wasn't like I didn't need to be there, uh, and I went to be there for myself, and I went to be there to support them as the senior pastor. And one night, uh, when we were all walking in, we always held it on Friday night, uh, everybody was given a piece of cardboard, cut out from a cardboard box, and a big magic marker. And everybody that was there was encouraged to write on that uh, magic marker what their problem was. Now, I just came up with an illustration. Uh, this wasn't my particular confession, but one by one by one, people got up in front of everybody that was there that night and held up their cardboard sign, and it might say, my struggles with drugs. Somebody might say, I've been taking cocaine since I was 17 years old, and I've been addicted for 14 years. It ruined my marriage. My kids don't talk to me. I've lost three jobs. I'm homeless, and I've hit bottom. And I don't know what to do, and I don't know where to go. So I came here. Somebody else would get up and say, uh, my struggle, my addiction is pornography. And I try to sneak it. I get up in the middle of the night when my wife is asleep so she doesn't know. I spend hours online. It's ruined my marriage. It's ruined our life together. I can't stop. Somebody else would get up and say, my problem is alcohol. Somebody else would get up and say, my problem is ga gambling. Somebody else would get up and say, uh, my problem is anger. I lose my temper. I yell. I scream. I say ugly, mean, hurtful things, and I bring great damage and pain to the people in my life. All kinds of confession, but one after another after another, people had the courage to stand up in that community and say, you know, here's where I'm really struggling with sin. And my only hope is Jesus. And they weren't condemned. And they weren't looked down on, and they weren't ridiculed. They didn't have to pretend to be something that they weren't. They didn't have to try to hide 
what their struggle or their pain might be. They were in a safe place where they could say, you know what, this is me. And I need you to love me. And I need you to support me. And I need you to pray for me. And I need you to be a part of my life. There was great power. It was a great moment for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was real love, support, and community uh, in that moment, in that place. And after I left that night, I thought of all the years of ministry I had and all the years of ministry I hoped to have. And I thought to myself, you know, why isn't every Sunday morning like that? Well, it's not like that because none of you would do it. And none of you would do it because you'd be too ashamed or you'd be too embarrassed. You'd worry about what everybody else thought. You'd be convinced they'd never look at you the same way again. You're not all that confident that we'd be that loving or that supportive or that we'd all join around you uh, in prayer in that moment. Uh, you might be thinking to yourself, you know, if I got up and really let you know what's going on in my life, if you knew the pain I've inflicted not only on myself, but the people I love, if you knew what's really going on in my life, I'm not so sure you'd welcome me back next Sunday. So we don't do it. And we diminish the gospel and we don't have the real community that God might want us to have. Those people really loved each other. Because those people knew the real me. All of which uh, brings us back to this text. You see, uh, we're talking about performing uh, miracles. And we're talking about Moses here. And, and it's time that we um, ask ourselves, well, what is the impossible? We've been talking about performing the impossible. What's the impossible We've been asked to perform this week, and what does that have to do with anything you just talked about? And what does that have to do with the text you just read? See, Moses said, they're, they're, they're not going to believe me. I don't think the emphasis in that statement is on them. It's not that they aren't going to believe me. It's that they aren't going to believe me. And the reason that they're not going to believe me is my past. So the challenge, I think, that God is wanting us to wrestle with this text is that can we be authentic? That's the word the millennials like. They want churches full of authentic people. Can we be real? Can we be truthful? Can we be honest? Can we be willing to admit to one another what Paul admitted you know, the Apostle Paul, the guy that conquers the Mediterranean world for Jesus, that plants his churches here and there and here and there and here and there. This incredible man of faith and commitment and passion for Jesus. But as an older man, he writes to young pastors and he says, you know, I am the chief of sinners. Notice he didn't say I was you know, back when I was a young, fiery Pharisee and uh, I was instrumental in getting Stephen stoned to death. Uh, remember when I was a young man and I got letters that gave me permission to go to Damascus and arrest the Christians and drag them back to Jerusalem where they would be martyred? No, 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 no. I'm not talking about what I used to do. I'm not saying I was the worst sinner. I am still now all these things I've done for God, all these churches I've planted and all of the witnessing I've done and all the miracles I've been a part of, I still am the biggest sinner you know. What if we weren't afraid to say, I'm broken and I'm flawed and I need you to love me? I make mistakes every day and it brings pain to me and to the people in my life. Can I come here and be reminded of the gospel of the Son of God who went to the cross with all my sin and washed me clean and made me whole and healed me? Because I need somebody that's going to remind me and love me like he loved me again 
and again and again and again and again and again because I can't seem to stop. Moses says, they won't believe me. Well, why not? You see, um, he says, I, 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 I'm supposed to go down there and tell them that you chose me. Uh, but, 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 but God, there's a problem. I was a prince of Egypt. You know, I, I was in line for the throne. I had power that was Unbelievable. I had a future that was indescribable. I had money. I had all the earthly things you could want were just, you know, at my beck and call. And then I discovered uh, uh, to my shock that I was one of the Hebrews and I, I was a part of these uh, slave people. So I tried to, okay, let me, let me find my roots. Let me find my people. Uh, let me see if I can fit in. And one day I saw this uh, Egyptian overlord and he was abusing this Hebrew slave. Uh, he was uh, injuring him. He was hurting him. Uh, and he wouldn't stop and he didn't care. Uh, and it got out of control and I, I killed him. I actually saved this man. I may have saved his life. I stopped his pain. I brought an end to his misery, at least temporarily. What was their reaction? Did they rally to my cause? Did they love me? Did they support me? No, they rejected me. They wanted no part of me. They didn't rally to my side. They ratted me out and threw me out. And I ran for my life. Now there's no TV. There's no radio. There's no books to read. There's no newspaper. All you do every day is go to work as a slave, come home, maybe spend an hour or so sitting around a table eating what meager food you have with your loved ones, you talk. Well, in that world, you tell stories. And so everybody grew up for the last 40 years hearing the story of this young Egyptian prince who had all power and fame and wealth and anything and everything he wanted. And he was next in line for the throne. And he threw that all away. And he's a murderer. He's a killer. And we purified our community by throwing him out because we don't tolerate murderers. We don't tolerate killers. That's not what God wants. That's not who we are as a people. And everybody knows the story of young Prince Moses. And now Moses is going to come back and say, hey, you know who God chose? He chose me. <laughs> Think about that. Who gets to be the leader of the people? Me! Yeah, the murderer. The killer. The guy you threw out. The guy you considered was the problem, not the solution. I'm back. I'm chosen. I'm called. Ta-da! And every one of them is going to go, no. <laughs> nice story burning bush. How long did it take you to come up with that one? God didn't choose you. God would never choose anyone like you. God wouldn't choose you. He'd never choose anyone like you. But you should be encouraged because he called somebody like me. No, I'm no better than you. I might be worse than you. I may have made moral choices you would never make. I may have done things you would never consider. I may have refused to do things and I have maybe refrained from doing things that you would do in a heartbeat because it's the right thing to do, but I didn't do it. God called me. 
God called you. God called us and brought us all together where we could find community and a safe place to be rescued and delivered and freed from all the struggles and the pain in our life. But we would have to be open and honest and authentic that we have struggles and that we have pain and not pretend anymore that we're something we're not or we're better than we're not. They're not going to believe me because they know the real me. So God says, well, okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, take your hand and, and, and put it you know, in your, your, your coat. Put it on your heart. Feel that? Yeah, yeah. Now pull it out. And he has leprosy. Now what's the point of that? You have to understand leprosy in an ancient world. Understand, first of all, there's a social stigma to leprosy. Because remember, in the ancient world, if something bad happened to you, that was God punishing you. Things don't just happen. Diseases don't just occur. God is punishing you. Remember the disciples? They walk up to Jesus. They see a blind man. And they say to Jesus, well, who sinned? Who did the wrong thing? Who did something so horrible and so evil that this man was born blind? Did he do it? so God is punishing him? Or did his mom and dad do it so that God is punishing his mom and dad by giving them a blind boy? But somebody has done something horrible here because this man is blind. Remember that? See, that's the way they think. So if you're a leper, you've done something horrible. You are a gross, immoral sinner. God is disgusted with you. Look what he visited you with. Leprosy. So the minute you're diagnosed, there's all this guilt and all this shame and all this rejection. There's no cure. You're going to die. Not necessarily today, not necessarily next week, depending on what particular type of leprosy or skin disease you have. It might be months, it might be years. But whatever length of time it is, it's going to be miserable and painful and ugly. And you have to face it alone. Because the law says if you're a leper, you're cast out of the community. You, you can't hang with us. We want no part of you because you're infectious. Get out. and you're cast out of the community. Does that sound familiar, Moses? Guilt, rejection, cast out, condemned, forgotten. Does that ring any bells in your life, Moses? How about you? Many of us are going to go, well, well, no, 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 Danny. I mean, you know, maybe some few minor little things, but not really to any real extent. And that's because you hide it well. And you lie well. And you pretend well. So we don't really know the real you. We'll, 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 we'll put it back in, Moses. Oh, oh, oh. Is it going to infect the rest of my body if, if, if I do that? I, 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 I could maybe cut it off and, 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 and be, put it back in, Moses. Pull it out. And it's whole, and it's healthy, and it's healed. Now you go down to those people and you do this miracle. And here's your whole sermon. This is me. 
I have a disease that's going to kill me. A disease that offends you. That you're afraid of. That you reject. You condemn me because you're convinced I have this disease because I've done something wrong. Well, I have done something wrong. Many things wrong. But you all know I killed a man. This is me. But one day God came into my life. It was a bush that was on fire and it didn't burn up. And God spoke to me. And God chose me. And God called me. And because of my encounter with God, this is the new me. That's my whole sermon. That's my whole testimony. That's the story of my life. In the waters of holy baptism, at the table of the Lord, through my private devotional life, Jesus Christ comes to me and comes to me and comes to me and delivers me and rescues me and heals me and reconciles me. And that God wants to work that in your life. And so the Bible says they heard him and they saw the signs and they believed him. So what happens to the man who shows up in a couple of weeks? He committed adultery, cheated on his wife. He was unfaithful. She found out. Destroyed her, ruined her whole life. She can't get over it, she can't get past it. She's filed for divorce. Can he come here? Does he dare tell us his story? Will we love him or condemn him? Will we pull our own leprous hands out and say, hey, I have no first stones. I cannot condemn you. But I want you to find Jesus. He healed me. He can heal you. You know, on a regular basis, there are prisoners released in the city of Aurora who've completed their sentence, done their time, served their debt to society, and are brought back into the community. What if they were a drug dealer in their past? What if what if they harmed children? What if they committed armed robbery? What if they hurt someone? Can they walk through those doors? Can they tell us their story? Is this a safe place for them? Will they find community or will they find rejection? Will they find sinners armed with that stone ready to let it fly? Or the gospel? Who's welcome? Who's not? Who can come and who can't? Who will we embrace and who will we refuse? We're here only because God worked deliverance in our lives. Can we be a place where God delivers the next sinner, the next broken life, the next ugly story?
Can everybody have their cardboard ready? This is me. I need Jesus. So do you. This is me. He loves me. And he loves you. This is me. But he rescued me and he delivered me. He forgave me and he saved me. And he wants to do that for you. Can that miracle happen here? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it all sounds so good and it all sounds so right and it's so, so hard for us to do. We've lived our whole lives condemning certain people for certain things, looking down on certain people for certain things. We've learned to criticize, we've learned to rebuke, we've learned to feel better and superior. We've learned to be grateful that, hey, that's not me, I didn't do that. We have forgotten the confession of the Apostle Paul who said, it's not what I used to do that you know, it's what I'm still doing, still sinning, still a part of my life. If it weren't for Jesus, I'd have no hope. But we have Jesus, and he lives in our hearts, and he washes us clean, and he makes us new every single day. So Jesus, make this community, our community, the body of Christ that gathers here. We ask in your holy and precious name, make us a safe place, a loving place, a forgiving place, a gospel-centered place. Not that we accept sin or tolerate sin, but that we lead people to a Savior. And then you do what only you can do. You work that miracle in their life. Make us real and authentic and truthful about who we are so that others realize they fit in. They're just like us. And we all need you. We want to pray for Dave and for Lynn and for all those who are struggling with COVID and so many, Lord, who are known to us who are struggling with illness and disease. We ask for your strength. We ask for your healing. We ask for your power to be displayed in their life. We pray for the people in Kentucky, the people in St. Louis who've been so devastated by these floodwaters. We pray for those who grieve and mourn the loss of loved ones. For those whose lives and uh, homes have been disrupted and destroyed, who cry out to you in this moment, hear their prayers, bless them, encourage them, comfort them, carry them through these days of trial. For the people of Ukraine and all around the world who find themselves in situations of violence and war, bloodshed and fear, we pray for their safety and protection. Turn the hearts of evil men who think that violence is the way to achieve their goals. Turn their hearts to goodness, to kindness, and to love. We pray for our president who's ill, and we ask for your healing grace. We pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris. We pray for uh, all in our Senate and our Congress. We pray for Governor Pritzker, for our mayors and our city councils. As, you, as you've asked us, we pray for all those in authority, pray for your wisdom. We pray for your discernment to know what's right, what's true, what's best, for the courage, the strength, and the perseverance to pursue it. For those who serve in our armed forces, our police officers, firefighters, our first responders, bless them, strengthen them, watch over them, protect them, keep them safe as they fulfill their duties. As we uh, continue, Lord, to walk through a political season, we see so much rancor, we see so much anger, and so much hatred. We see so little respect and love. 
Let us repent of this and let us love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Let us love them if their party is different than ours, their philosophy is different than ours, their viewpoints are different than ours. Let us love them as you have loved us. Let us respect them as you have given us respect and value. We pray, Lord, for all the issues that are on our hearts. We all have concerns, worries. We'll have fears. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to intercede on our behalf as we come to you in the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.